Hello and welcome to another Hawker Brownlow Education author interview. Today I'm delighted to be joined by clinical psychologist Andrew Fuller, one of the two authors of Neurodevelopmental Differentiation, Optimizing Brain Systems to Maximize Learning. In this book, the authors want to help educators build a school where everybody gets smart, not just some students, but every student, and all through the power of neurodevelopmental differentiation. And to help walk us through exactly what that means, I'm joined by Andrew Fuller. Andrew, welcome. Hi, it's great to be with you. And I thought I'd get started with the term differentiation. Uh, A lot of our uh, customers would probably be aware of Carol Tomlinson's work on differentiation. I guess, what is the difference in her approach to differentiation uh, and the one that you've taken in your book? Well, differentiation is a great concept, but often difficult to do in schools in reality. So it often boils down to thinking about how to cater to kids' interests and passions. And that's a a good way of thinking about it. And Carol Ann's work's been fantastic in terms of thinking about catering for individual minds. What this research does is add to that wonderful body of research that Carol Ann has put in place and basically looks at the neuroscience behind it and looks at basically learning strengths or information processing pathways in the brain and how we can use those as a start, as a basis to differentiate so that we build from where kids are already strong into areas where they're not so strong. And so it's not so much that learning strengths are uh, a replication of multiple intelligences or learning styles. That's a different and in some ways a more historical body of research. This is this is new research and it's exciting research, but it's also not trying to label kids. It's trying to use where they're already basically going well to increase their engagement and differentiate along those basis, on that basis. So learning strengths are obviously a, a, a key part of, of your work. Um, so can you just delve a little bit deeper into what they are and perhaps more importantly, what they aren't? So learning strengths aren't a form of intelligence, but what we know is that the human brain, uh, particularly in the teenage years and the upper childhood years, undergoes a period of serious myelination. And that myelination speeds up thinking. But about 40% of our brain is myelinated, which means that 40% of our brain thinks faster than the other 60%. Now that 40%, that pattern of that white matter in your brain, or myelin sheathing, basically is different for everybody. And so everyone has different areas and types of information that they will process faster than others. And they often feel more confident and more adept around those. In terms of the learning strengths themselves, the major areas that we looked at in terms of the research were spatial reasoning, thinking in pictures, number smarts, of course, thinking in logic, mainly with the frontal lobes, of course, planning and sequencing, word smarts, perceptual motives, so using your body to, and your awareness to learn, concentration and memory, and of course, uh, people smarts, so learning how to deal with people that understand yourself. And so everyone probably has some of these where they're already pretty adept and others where they're a little bit chunky, really, um, and so or a bit more challenged. And part of the, the reason to differentiate is to think, how do I call upon the strengths of a group of kids or an individual to help them to plan to develop something else that they're not so strong in? I suppose one of the risks of catering to strengths is that you neglect the areas which aren't as strong. So this is more about using the learning strengths as a basis and then using those to build upon areas that they're not as adept in. Yeah, so it's basically facilitating a personalised learning plan for every student. And so essentially what you can then do is say, well, these are a couple of areas that you're already strong in. That's fantastic. That's great, Richard. We love that. And now let's use those. So, for example, Richard, if you were strong, say, in language and words and also strong in spatial reasoning, uh, but perhaps not quite so adept in the numbers area, we You've might say, well, <laughs> <laughs> basically, one of the things we might ask you then to do is to try and create stories involving numbers or learn how to map out basically in pictures, the things that are the concepts that you're trying to convey numerically. And by doing that, you'll get an increase in your number smarts as well. 
well, I wish that would have been around when uh, when I was at school because I think I could have used that. Um, and speaking of which, I guess what what do you see when you're looking more holistically at the broader educational system? What do you see are the main sort of weaknesses in in the way your average student has their work structured and the and the way the curriculum works with students? Well, the first thing I think that for senior students, we often think that they are metacognitively capable, that they know how they learn best. And I would say they do not know that. And so unless we explicitly help them to understand that they do have some areas where they're strong and some areas where they can use those strengths to develop other areas, they won't do it. And so the first thing we have to help them to understand is that not everyone is smart at everything. So kids are absolutists generally, and what they often know is, well, I'm really smart at that, but I'm no good at that. And that's, that, that's the end of the story. And that's not the end of the story. So basically our mission really is to help kids to learn how to transfer strengths into other areas. It's also about thinking about how we can structure schools differently. Schools have been preoccupied, sadly in my view, with the ranking of children in terms of their performance on a very, well, a fairly limited number of criteria. And really one of the things that this book, Neurodevelopmental Differentiation, is about is essentially saying, here, everyone gets smart. Not just some of you, all of you. And so trying to create schools where everyone gets smart, which becomes a major kind of theme throughout the school. We are a strength-based education system. So what does a school look like where everyone gets smart? Let's, let's go to the, the classroom level because that's probably the simplest way to understand it. So let's say a teacher has done his or her learning strengths analysis and has decided they are probably fairly good at thinking in logic and language and words, okay, because they are a successful school student who decided to go on and seek a career in education. Something like that might be that pattern. So then they analyse the learning strengths of their students and so rather than basically trying to be all things to all people, you might say, well, I know I'm more a thinking logic language words person, but I know that in the class there are people who are more adept at, say, concentration and memory or perceptual motor skills. How about you get together in a small group and devise a way for us to physically remember this bit of information? So I want you to think about some movements or a sequence of movements that will help the rest of the class to recall that. So what you are having then is distributed leadership in a classroom where you're recognising the strengths of kids. So an example of that is that one of the tragedies in my view in many schools are kids who are very adept at perceptual motor skills often see themselves as the sporty kind of kids who can't do much else, but they're really physical. And teaching those kids, for example, how to use their physicality in other ways to perhaps apply it to number smarts or story making or using it to basically build their memory enhances their range, their repertoire of success strategies. There are probably a lot of educators out there who think this all sounds great in theory, but it's you know in practice too hard to do. What do you, what do you have to say to educators out there who feel like this sort of thing is all a bit beyond them? Well, it's easiest to go the way the river's flowing. And so basically, if you can know the way your kids basically are do, doing something already well and call upon that, guess what happens to your relationship with that child? So suddenly they're feeling acknowledged for something they're good at and you're encouraging them to use that and contribute based on that. So they're suddenly contributing in class, they're engaged more and they're feeling more positive to you. Now, one of the things I often say to teachers, to be a happy teacher, you've got to basically have good relationships with the people you spend most time with. And the people you spend most time with are your students. And so if you can build positive relationships with your students, happy career. Have a miserable relationship with students, miserable career. It's a really simple formula. And so basically helping you to develop a, an approach where you acknowledge the treasures within kids, I think is really what we're aiming to do in this business. Mm. In, uh, in a normal time, uh, all of this might be you know, a bit easier to do than how it is now here in Victoria. We're, of course, in the midst of a, a second lockdown uh, with uh, education from home to continue uh, from next week for, for term three. Um, do you have any advice for parents or educators or even students 
out there in the midst of all this thinking, geez, this is anything but the normal school year that we, uh, we would like to have had. There's two disparate reactions. One is, of course, I know people are doing it tough. I'm a clinical psychologist. I work in counselling and I'm dealing with all sorts of distressed behaviours. So I'm fully aware of how much stress and, stress and pressure people are under. But the other part of it is to say to teachers, well, I know there's some toughness about basically having to basically adjust and really be on the, the front foot all the time. But for many people, they've been complaining about NAPLAN for years. They've been complaining about as regular assessments for years. And they've been complaining about how schools are hitched to year 12 results for years. Now, year 12, who knows what's going to happen, really. It just seems kind of a crazy world, those poor year 12 students. Um, but NAPLAN's off the agenda and regular assessments, well, you know. So in a way, this is a time of freedom as well as a time of stress. And so... We can just be stressed or we can use that freedom to start to think about how we adapt differently. Now, if we can start then to use this time to get to know our kids better as learners, as people, then we're better positioned basically to help not just them but their parents you know, basically start to think about ways to encourage their, their passion towards learning. So essentially the things that really long-term predict success are academic self-efficacy and motivation and having a sense that you as a learner are a capable person makes an incredible difference in terms of your long-term results. You've worked in classrooms for quite a while, adolescent psychology. Um, what are some of the more egregious brain and intelligence myths uh, that you've seen in your times working with students and, and educators? Well, one of the interesting ones that, of course, are that we have basically just one way of being clever and narrowing ourselves down to that, which seems to me to be an incredible limitation on our understanding of human capacity and human potential. And I think it's also important to realise that our brain is partly biologically preset so the structure of your brain is very similar to human beings 40,000 years ago, as best we can tell. But the internal wiring of it is remarkably different. And so basically the connections within it, the transfer of information, and we're just really starting to get the research because we're just getting the refinement of the scanning devices that can help us to see as we get that transfer of information along those pathways. But it's an incredibly exciting time. So in a way, you wouldn't be in a better time in history than now because, of course, what you've got is we know enough about learning. We know enough about brains. We basically will learn more, of course, because we will have more and more refined methods to do this. But in a way, we're at the first time in history really able to merge those and go, this is what we know works and this is we know why it works. And if we can do that, we can get a clarity about the effectiveness of our efforts. Whereas before, it's been a bit shooting in the blind, really. It's basically being in the dark and trying to work out what to do, which is almost for the average for all kids. And that's a great shame, I think. What's next for you in this field? Well, certainly in the short time that the website, mylearningstrengths.com, has been up, uh, 11,000 students across the world have done that. And it's been a remarkable thing to get an email from not all, a lot, you know, from quite a few students, but not everyone. Um, and the sentiment behind those is, is sort of heartwarming and heartbreaking at the same time. So I get emails from kids in America or Japan or China that say, could you tell my teacher because she doesn't know that I'm smart? Or would you let my dad know because he thinks I'm dumb or whatever it might be. And it's clear that basically having... Um, Having an adult outside your family, an, an adult who's neither a teacher nor a parent, who basically, because uh, the, the, the analysis gives you a letter from me, which sort of says, congratulations, Richard, you're good this and this. If you want to get in another area, here's a way of doing it. And uh, clearly having that outside voice is helpful. So even kids, and there are some kids that will email me and say, I disagree entirely with what, uh, what the analysis says. Uh, but, of course, that's also valuable to go back to them and go, well, okay, what do you think is true? Because it's just really, it's not, as I said before, it's not trying to pin kids down and label them. It's trying to find a starting point 
from which they can flourish. All right. Well, Andrew Fuller, thank you so much for your time today. Neurodevelopmental Differentiation is available now at hba.com.au. Uh, it's a really great book, and I think it would be a really valuable addition to any educator's professional learning library um, as we work through the, particularly through the new normal at the moment. So, Andrew, thank you very much. Thanks, Richard. It's been a delight to talk to you all. Bye.